Hi, everyone. Let me invite you uh, to the um, HIPCON uh, party tonight before I announce the next talk. It will happen at uh, Combat Vorana, Jazz Cantina Lisbon, and starts at 6.30. You are all invited. Okay, uh, I would like to welcome Vladimir Dejanovic today. Uh, he will be talking about uh, microservices. Microservices seem to, seems to be like the hot topic nowadays, and he will guide us through the galaxy of microservices, and he will tell us about um, how far one can go. Vladimir, welcome to HIPCON. Thanks. Okay, so welcome everybody to my talk, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Microservices. First of all, I would like to thank you for choosing this talk. I know there are a lot of great talks happening at the same time, so thank you for choosing this one. Of course, this doesn't work, like always. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. So my name is Vladimir Djanovic. This is my ma Twitter, mail, GitHub account, blog, if you want to contact me online or follow me online. Originally, I'm from Serbia and beautiful city of Belgrade, so it's good to be home. Uh, currently, I'm living in Netherlands and the beautiful city of Amsterdam. I'm part of professional IT scene since 2006. In other words, I'm getting paid for delivering software since 2006. I worked on all kinds of technologies, projects, you, you name it, I did it. My day job is a senior director of B2C and B2B technology of, at PVH. PVH is a fashion tech company behind brands such as Tommy Hilfiger and Kevin Klein. My night job is founder and leader of Amsterdam Java User Group. Also, I'm speaker at conferences around the world. I'm Java One Rockstar and Code One Star. But enough about me. So what's this talk is going to be about? First, we're going to look at the microservices and some of the reasons people decide to go on the road of microservices. Then we will look at Monolith and some of the things that basically you need to be aware of and be, you know, know about mon your own Monolith before you decide to break it up. Then, you know, after that, we're going to spend the majority of the talk in Hitchhiker's Guide. And at the end, there will be some time for questions. So if you have any questions, please wait until the end. Or you can always contact me uh, online, or you know, I'll be here also in the conference itself. Word of caution, all the things that I'm sharing with you are coming from my own personal experience. So take them as, with a grain of salt. Your use case might be different than mine. So let us look at microservices and why, what are some of the reasons that, you know, that people would like or actually going to the microservice route. So there may be a lot of reasons, but I see some of them popping up over and over again. First of all, them being they're cool, right? They're interesting. You know, they are the must at uh, this point of time. If we're not use, using microservices, our code is basically legacy code and it will die anytime soon, right? There's a lot and a lot of hype around it. And you know, let's be honest, we as developers, we like to work on a shiny new stuff on the edge of technology, especially if it's cool. But you know, don't forget that you know, when there's shiny things, there's also you know, somewhere dangerous lurking behind. You know? So you know, we always say, OK, yeah, the grass is green on the other side, on the other side of the fence. But you know, and when people show us the new stuff, they show us the cool and fancy nice stuff and say, OK, this is the reasons why you should be using this new technology. Usually, they don't show us you know, the, all the not so nice stuff and dangerous stuff you know, in the background. You know. So nothing comes for free. You know. It's the only question you know, if the benefits outweigh the cost of some new technology. So think about it. Another thing that I often hear is, well, we can write every single microservice in different language, right? So we can leverage the fact that different languages and different technology stacks have different benefits and prompts, and we can basically just take the customized one for each use case, right? And let's be honest, this is partially true. You can write every single microservice in different programming language in a different technology stack. However, from my point of view, it sounds like, jump, like you know, jumping a bungee into active volcano. The fact that you can do it doesn't necessarily mean that you should be doing that. Imagine for a second if you have one microservice in Java, one in Go, one in Node.js, one in Ruby, one in Python, one in C++, and so on. Will you have one team that's going to support all of that? Or are you going to have separate teams for every single microservice? Are you going to hire people who are actually specialists in the programming language of one of those microservices and put them to work only there? Or are you going to ask, ask actually hire somebody who is fluent in all those programming languages. 
The fact that we can go very diverse doesn't mean that we should do. From my personal experience, the less diversity, in this case, it's better. So be as little diverse as possible. Your future you will be very thankful for that. Another common reason that I hear is you know, that our current monolith isn't really the best. So more than a few people would actually explain their monolith with something like this. I know I did it. Basically, I put similar picture as a icon for a Git repo of one of the monoliths that I was working, because that's how I felt about it. You know, I was scared of it. On the other hand, when people are talking about the microservices and the future state where they want to go, they show you something like this. A lot of nice you know, unicorns. And of course, they put something like this on top. So it's all rainbows and unicorns. It's all shiny and glitter. Everything is nice. Everything is perfect. Well, the truth is, this trip isn't without its dangers. There is, it's very easy to make mistakes along the way. You know, and in that case, it's very easy to end up somewhere here. So if we are not careful with microservices, we can end up in much worse state than we can actually like, with a monolith. Or like, so it's, it doesn't matter like if we're, we have a monolith, we're breaking it apart, we're going from a greenfield project and we're creating the microservices out of the box. If we are not careful, we will end up here. So be very careful about the choices that you make. Try to think a few steps ahead if you can. From my personal point of view, if I can need to choose between the bad monolith or the bad, bad microservices, I would choose the bad monolith every single time. Reason for that is very simple. I can fix it more easily. My e ID knows how to work with it. You know, my debugger knows how to work with it. If there is a problem, if there is an issue, it's inside the monolith. I can refactor the code in an easier way. So be aware of the dangers. And this is my favorite one. Consult has told us so. True story, a few weeks ago, I was in a meeting with a salesperson. The salesperson has zero technical knowledge, and he was explaining to me why we should be using microservices and all the benefits of it. So what I want you to remember is this. You should not always listen to your consultant, and you should always challenge them. Let's be honest, in most cases, consult consultants knows, know a lot of stuff. However, they don't know a lot of stuff about your company and about the way of working inside your company. So, and also, unfortunately, you know, some of the consultants actually have a hidden agenda you know, when they're talking to you. So keep that in mind. So true story, again, I was in one company, and basically we had a consultant. And the consultant was explaining to us, OK, why we should be moving to the microservices, why we should do all the new fancy stuff. And I just pointed out two things in that meeting and completely derailed it. So what I said is this, OK, if I have my application, it has three instances, and I want to add one more, just one more. Basically, I need to go and fill in the form, and then I need to wait for a lead time of a few months. Because again, the company will not buy only my machine. They're going to buy the full stack you know, of, of machines for the data center. You know. So dynamic scaling in this kind of situation isn't really you know, an, an option. Another thing, let's say that this is my monolith, right? And I want to split it up. So I want to create another service, microservice or whatever. Again, I needed to fill in a lot of paperwork to actually for this to be approved. And basically, overhead of a paperwork is going to take me at least a month. And then I'm going to have constant overhead of, of a lot of paperwork. You know, we're dealing with all kinds of stuff. Basically, this is the way how this company was working. You know, so in this kind of setup, the microservices are not really an option. First, you need to fix all of these issues, and then you can basically go to the microservices. And again, consultant had no clue about all of this. So you know, keep this in mind, because you know, if a consultant comes to your boss and says, microservices, and your boss says, yes, you will have to deal with all of this. So think about it. OK, so let us look now at the monolith. So monoliths can be very effective. I worked on more than one very effective monolith. And also, they can be extremely dangerous. I also worked on, more th worked on more than one of those. So before we start breaking up the monolith, there are a few things that we should think about and basically and, and, you know, and, and learn. Otherwise, they can come back and bite us you know, at a later stage. So the first thing that I'm always interested in when I'm talking about any kind of system is what are the dependencies and the data sources for that system? It's fair to say that on more than one occasion, 
usually it looks something like this, a huge mess. And again, your monolith is somewhere deep inside this mess. And I'm sad to say, usually this mess goes inside the monolith itself. So we need to be aware of this. We need to understand this ecosystem, because the more information we have, the more calculated and right decisions we are going to make along the way, especially if we want to break up the monolith and try to untangle all of this mess. The next important subject is you know, around the troubleshooting. And basically, you know, what is at our disposal at this point of time? What are the tools that we can actually use to, you know, to troubleshoot the current monolith, current system? Important, puzzle of, uh, important parts of the puzzle here, of course, are locks. How you deal with locks? Do you have some fancy tools? Or basically you have a lot of bash scripts? Or you have to go through each, every single instance from basically machine to machine to look at the locks when something goes wrong? So I have seen it all. And again, when you move to the microservices, let's be honest, you're going to have much more instances that you have now. All of them are going to have locks. So you know, how are you going to deal with them? Is your current setup good enough? If it's yes, then perfect. If not, then you know, we need to fig figure out that before we start moving to monoliths, to microservice, sorry. And again, next stuff that I can't stress enough is basically monitoring. How good is your monitoring, you know? How good is your monitoring is seeing, okay, what kind of requests are coming? What's the response time? Do, do you get errors? How many users do you have? You know, like, uh, how is your monitoring basically on CPU, memory, hard drive, you know? on third-party systems, are they behaving good or not? So monitoring is a key, especially in any kind of distributed or big system, because we're going to have a lot of systems talking around, so we need to be aware of the problems before our end users see them. We have to be aware that something is becoming a problem before it actually becomes a really big problem. Because if we notice it, then we can fix it, we can solve it before you know, it either explodes or the end users notice that. And another important thing is how your deployment process looks like. You know, how, you know, does, is it like a lot of manual steps and a lot of things that you need to do? Or is it all like pipelines and automation with one click and it's magically happened? Just think for a second. Deployment process that you have today, will it work good if tomorrow you need to deploy hundreds of microservices? If the answer is no, then yeah, probably you should fix that first before you start actually breaking up the monolith. OK, so let us now go on a journey through the microservices galaxy, right? And the whole point for us being here is because we want to split the monolith if we have one. Or if we don't have one and we're building microservices, then we don't want to end up with one, right? Every journey starts with a question. And I think that we should all know the answer, ultimate answer, right? Well, the ultimate answer being 42. Uh, however, in this case, we are going to ask a little bit different, slightly different question. The question at the hand that we're going to ask is, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? Again, if you don't know the answer to this question, then how are you going to know that what you're doing is actually a good thing? How are you going to know that you're actually on the right path? You need to be able to answer this question so that you can actually validate if your course of action is good or not. So this is a very important thing. Is your end goal just to have a lot of nice microservices? Or is there a real problem that you're trying to solve? And again, keep in mind, adding additional microservices means adding more complexity. So be careful about creating the new microservices. You know, like, you know, if you're just creating them for creating sake, then that's not a good approach. You're hurting yourself. If you're solving a real problem, then again, you need to know, OK, what is the problem that you're solving? So that's why you need to know the answer to the question itself. Another next thing that's also very big and very important is basically domains, borders, and data sources. This is a very important part if you're breaking up a monolith, and it's also a very important part if you're just starting with the microservices. So usually, the good starting point is identify your domains, whatever they are, and then create one service per domain, only one, no more. So don't start like, you know, like guns blazing and just creating millions of microservices and services all over the place. Per domain, create only one, and then look at them. 
and say, okay, is this domain maybe too big? Is there maybe reason that we should actually split this in our domain into two or three? And then if there is real need, there is real problem, then break them apart. Why I'm saying this? Well, imagine this. Imagine that I give you a task. Task is draw me a world map. And if I tell you, okay, draw me the world map, but draw each country, you know, single country by country, will you be able to do it? I definitely wouldn't. However, if I told you differently, okay, draw me the world map, but first draw the continents. When you draw the continents, then start drawing like individual countries. Well, I could get much, much further with that. I'm still not going to be able to do it, but I bet you that somebody will be able to do it in that way. The same thing is also with the software. You know, start bigger and then look, okay, can we, do we need to split it? Do we need to go smaller? If you start from the beginning very small, you're going to just shoot yourself in the foot. And again, with everything, like, like with the countries, also like, you know, with the software, borders do matter. And, you know, one thing that, you know, that I see very often not done good enough is basically specifications about borders and interaction between different parts of a system. And that shouldn't be the case, you know. Uh, we should make sure that all the specifications, all the interactions are documented in a very good way. And there's a lot of tools out there that can help us do that in a very easy way. For example, some of these, you know, Open API Spec, Swagger, RAML, API Blueprint. All of them are well known. There are tools out there that actually know how to interact with them. There are libraries which actually also will going to do a lot of work for you. So use them, you know, make your life easier. But again, make sure that you have good, good boundaries. And they're documented in a very good way. Okay, so let's now go a little bit more like to the subject matter at hand. So let's imagine that we have a monolith. And we have one data source, which is a database. And of course, to make it more complex, let's have another data source and that's some third party system, right? So let's assume now that we want to break up this monolith. So the one way that we can break up is this, right? But I think that, you know, my gut feeling says that it's, you also have the same assumption about this as me, that this doesn't really sound as right, you know, that this doesn't sound as a good way to actually break up this monolith, because what kind of problem are we solving here, right? I think that we all agree it should probably be something more like this, especially if these two domains have very different logic, they have different basic data sources, they are completely isolated, so then split like this, will be very easy and very logical one. But what happens then if these two basically needs to communi communicate? Well, it's an easy thing, just we just create a communication bridge between them, right? Be very careful with this. Because again, this what this means is actually it means that there is a hoop in communication between these two parts of a system, what used to be basically internal fast calls, now it's network calls, which are slow and unreliable. So if your end user basically is somewhere on the left, then it basically goes to the orange thing, and then it, to sort of thing, we need to go to the green thing, and we, know we need to go to the blue thing, and then we need to come back, and then we need to go to the database. We created more mess, and we create actually more problems than actually it worked. So maybe, if this communication is really needed due to the fact that we need to use both these data sources to serve our customers, then maybe the first actually split was more logical or like, or basically the good next step in going into even better end state. So be always very careful when you're adding any kind of communications because more things can go wrong, systems becoming more messy, and then again, you end up, you can end up in a universe state that you are. Another common way that we can split a monolith Okay, it's like this. So we basically identify small part of the domain that's completely like isolated, so to say, and we just take it out. As a first step, we can keep the same data source, and then in the next step, we can basically okay, also take its database out. Perfect, right? One thing that I want to point out is here that's two slides only. However, you need to be very careful when you do this and again, and depending on your use case, this can take a lot of time. You know, in one of projects that I worked, it took like three months. So slides can lie. 
And again, you know, if there is need for communication between the main system and the system here, again, we can just create that communication. But again, be careful about, you know, like why you're adding this communication. Is it really needed or not? If it's needed, okay, add it then. But be critical and make sure that you do it in a good way. One thing that I want to point out is if this green thingy, whatever, is really mission critical, it can't be down, it, it has to be working perfectly, then I would suggest keep it also inside as a first step. So basically identify what you want to take out, take it out, but keep also the one version inside. So then when actually there's a need communication, you use a request something, goes to the orange thingy, then you call first the green stuff. If it works, perfect. If it doesn't, you fall back to your internal stuff and you log it. Then basically, you know, you also need to like look at some time, okay, like if there's problems happening, okay, how we can fix them, you know, how we can make sure that, you know, calls to the green stuff never fails. And only when you're 100% sure that it's all is good, then remove the internal stuff. Another big topic on this journey is, of course, deployment process. So I think we all know the good old blue and green deployment process, right? We have a blue system, basically, which is live. So we put everything, we deploy everything on the green. When we deploy everything, we check everything is good. We flip the switch, then the green is live, and then we start deploying next up to the blue one, right? Another one, of course, is rolling update, where we have multiple instances of our service. So we basically you know, update one instance at a time until we roll out, basically, update across all of them. Again, should be known stuff. And of course, we should never forget the canary release, where we actually, when we want to deploy something, we expose the new version, the new functionality, only to a very small subset of our end users. And only if everything is good, then we start basically exposing to the rest of the public. The idea behind this is very simple. If we have any problems or bugs or issues, again, you know, like the, the blast radius will be much, much, much smaller. From the point of microservices versus monoliths, all of this basically stands, so it doesn't really matter. So you can use any kind of, of this uh, basic deployment process in both with microservices and with, with the monoliths. What you should be using really depends from your use case. Important difference when it comes to the microservices versus the monoliths is that basically there are actually two ways of deployment, only two ways. Way number one is each microservice will have its own separate deployment process. So it means basically completely isolated from everybody else. It's going to move at the speed that it should move depending on the team requirements and all other kind of stuff. And that's way number one. So basically everybody goes on its own. Way number two is basically we use something called release train. Here everybody goes together. Again, it's a very simple concept. You have a lot of microservices, all of the microservices which are ready to be deployed, all hop on together on the release train, and then the release train leaves the station. The release train will take all those microservices that needs to be deployed to each environment basically as a group. So it will take, of course, everybody to the test. You do the testing for all, all of them together. If everything is good, you move them to acceptance. If all is good, you move to production, things like that. Idea basically here is that, again, due to all dependencies, you actually test all of them together so you make sure that no errors are going to end up with, the, with your users. Both approaches have pros and cons. I've seen both of them in, the, in basically in real-time situation, and I can you know, talk much, much longer about what's the good and what's the bad with both of them. The important part that you need to remember is that both of these approaches are trying to solve a very important problem in a different way. And the problem that at hand that you're trying to solve is, okay, what to do when things go wrong, and things will go wrong. That's the fact, fact, fact of life. So in the case of deploying microservices independently, biggest advantage is, of course, yes, we can move at our own speed that we want to move. So it's, we don't have to wait for everybody else to be finished. If we are fast, we can be fast. If we are slow, we can be very slow. However, the biggest problem is, OK, how we make sure that we don't introduce bugs and errors in the system, right? Because again, like a lot of systems can be depend on us. So how can we make sure that we don't bring all the errors in the production? The reason for me saying this is because although we should test everything like it's production, in 99% of the cases, all the tests are done around the mocks or some f stuff which are kind of mocky or not really production ready. Another big problem with the single 
release cycle is backwards compatibility. Because, OK, I created my service, I'm very fast, and I want to break, create a breaking change, I want to push to production. But wait, there are still a lot of other services depending on my old version. So I can't really you know, just remove it away. So again, it means that I need to support it for a longer period of time. From the release train point of view, these are not really the issues. Because again, in theory, well, in theory at least, because what you do is you pack all, all of them together. You basically test them all together. So if they work all together in test, then you can move them to acceptance and so on. So in theory, when you hit production, all of them will be working great together. However, what about if there is a problem, you know? So let's assume we are on the release train. We start doing release train. We're almost in hitting the production. Then we figure out that there is a bug in some service. What should we do then? Well, we can kick out the service that's causing the problem out, right? But then who guarantees us that you know, the, the whole release train is actually good? Well, then we need to basically go back and release, do all the steps again, right? Or we can say, OK, well, yeah, but you know, maybe this is a very important feature. So we can stop the release train and basically block it, wait for everybody to fix this issue. But again, we again need to go through all the cycle again. And another very interesting thing that I always like to question is, OK, like what happens if there is some critical bug in a system, right? So in the case of a single microservices deployment, we can just deploy that microservice and all is done. But what do we do with the release train? Do we kick it all, all the whole release train or we use some other process? Again, both things have both pros and cons. Important stuff is whatever you choose, make sure to automate. Automate everything. If, if you can, to have it completely automated, just one click of a button and everything magically happens, do it. OK. The next important part is basically a very fun part, and that's troubleshooting. And that's what should we do when actually things go wrong, and you know, how we figure out that things will go wrong, and, you know, or that things are going to get wrong. So for decades, logs were the main source of truth, basically, in this case, and the main thing that actually helped us debug and figure out what was happening in the real systems, because usually logs provided a very good insight into what's happening. At least good logs do. I personally like to use Elk Stack. And Elk stack consists of few components. So the first component is basically log stash. Log stash basically takes all the logs, process them, enriches them, you know, change, do transformations if needed, uh, needed, and then basically takes all the information from all the logs from all the instances and ship them to Elasticsearch. Then all those information is basically stored in Elasticsearch for troubleshooting, future or current, you know, all those kind of things. Basically, it's stored there for as long as we want. And then what we actually do, we put on the top of Elasticsearch, we put Kibana, so we can create a very nice graphs and visualization of things, what's actually happening in the system, you know, and also be able to troubleshoot if things go wrong. The reason why I personally like Elk Stack is because it's very flexible. So if you have a monolith, you can use it. If you have microservices, you can use it. If you're running your system on basically on, on prem, on the physical hardware yourself, you can use it. If you're running it in the cloud, you can use it. If you're basically what, in any kind of setup you are, you can use it. And not only that you can use it to actually you know, check for logs and basically do the troubleshooting, you can also do monitoring with it. So when we come to monitoring, that's another extremely big part of any distributed system or any system under high load. One of the things that I personally like to use is graphite. Anybody know what graphite is? OK, one, two, three hands, OK. So in a nutshell, Graphite is a time series database. It also has capability to create graphs out of the box. But in a nutshell, idea is that you have your systems, instances, and they basically send the data to the Graphite, and the Graphite basically then keeps them for as long as you want or for as long as you actually have space. It's basically a database. Another thing similar to the Graphite is InfluxDB. InfluxDB is also a time series database. So they're very similar, so to say. The key point with both, oh, I need to hurry up. The key point with both like Graphite and InfluxDB is that they are databases, which means your instances are going to send information to them, which means you, if you have a lot of instances or they're hitting the, sending a lot of information all the time, you can actually DDoS them. That's why some guys actually created Prometheus, because the idea behind the Prometheus is you don't have one central service. Prometheus goes with your application. So each instance of your application has its own instance of Prometheus, 
which keeps all the metrics that you're interested about your system yourself, and then you can basically just use and you know pull information which when you need it. The good thing about Prometheus is, of course, you know you don't have a problem with the graph at in InfluxDB going down because again you need to make sure that they don't go down if you have a lot of systems. With Prometheus, it will not happen. Unfortunately, with Prometheus, what's mo what can happen is very easy thing, and that is you have a problem with your service, it goes down, all the metrics, all the information is gone. So good luck finding out what happened, you know? Again, you, there is a workaround how you can actually you know, take that information and keep it somewhere, but it doesn't come out of the box. Usually what I like to, to do is just put Grafana on top of it. Graphite provides out of the box graphs itself, which is also very good, but I find Grafana more user-friendly, so I'm not sure if InfluxDB or Prometheus has a similar way to just create graphs themselves, because I just you know, use Grafana out of the box on, on them. I didn't even want to bother with anything else. And again, you know, like if you have your users knowing Grafana, then it's like this is just basically the data source that you just plug in. Another important part of basically troubleshooting is, of course, tracing. Because if we're talking about any kind of distributed systems, it's normal thing that we have service A calling service B, calling service C, and so on. So we need to figure out where exactly you know what's happening. I worked in a company who created their own tracing system, and it was great. It was really working perfectly. I, we all really loved it. Uh, if you think about it, creating your own tracing system is that simple. You just need to actually add the tracing ID for every single request and then use that information with some other logic to actually okay, do the tracing yourself. When it comes to do it yourself approach, I would say please don't do it. I know we all will be tempted to do it because it doesn't sound very complex, but again, if you do it, it means you're spending your time and money on developing something you know, while you can actually use the same money to actually go and buy some products, which is going to do the same thing that you're actually building. And again, if your core business isn't tracing and somebody else is, then probably they're going to make a better solution than you. So, and also, if you don't want to spend money, you can also use Zipkin, right? It's battle tested, it's, you know, it's very proven, it's supported in many languages, a lot of tools and frameworks actually you know, can plug in with it extremely easy. Also, you know, it has a very nice UI, so you don't have to bother dealing with all of that. Another thing is also open tracing. Yeah, I need to read this because the so idea is to create vendor neutral APIs and instrumentation for distributed tracing. A long sentence. In a nutshell, it means basically that they want to create something which is not language specific or vendor specific. There is a lot of implementations in all kinds of languages, libraries, frameworks, and so on. It's very, and also it's part of cloud computing foundation, so it, it's here to stay. What I want to point out is in the case you're using Docker, some of the things will, might, will be different than actually when you're working with VMs or basically physical machines. So one thing that you need to be aware of in case you're actually shipping your code in Docker, don't create log files. By default, Tomcat and all kinds of application servers are creating the log files, but that's a great way to actually bring your Docker down. Because again, at one point, you're going to stay out of the space and then, then it's game over. The best practice in case of Docker is just push everything to standard out and then there are tools to actually consume all those kind of things. Also, if you're moving to the cloud, well, then there are even bigger options that you can choose. Any proud cl cl cloud provider is going to give you a lot of tools from their tool chain for like logs, metrics, statistics, you're tracing all kind of things, so you can use them, you can use all the things that actually I show you so far. You there's also like the paid solutions, you know, there's a lot of them. The main thing that you need to remember is just use something. Using anything is better than using nothing. I know that sometimes people are blocked because, oh, will I choose the right tool? Don't care. Just choose some tool, see how it works for you, see what are the benefits, does it work for you or not, and then you can very easily switch to something else if that doesn't work. Quickly, I want to talk about 12-factor app. The reason why I'm going to want to talk about 12-factor app is because over and over I see it being mentioned in conjunction with microservices. 12-factor app and microservices are two completely different things. So it's a basically how you should actually build your app, like some best practices. Some things that I see that people are getting wrong, uh, especially when it comes to the 12-factor app, is one thing is mentioned there is code base. So it says one code of extract in the revision control when it deploys. Some people take this literally and think that for every single application, they need to have one single Git repo. So I worked with one Git repo, which actually hosted like all the microservices and applications of 
that company. It was perfect. I worked also in a company where every single application has its own Git repo. It also worked perfect. So both things can be perfect and both things can be terrible. Depends on the use case. What, what you shouldn't be doing is creating a Git repo for each module in case that, each, that module doesn't have a life cycle of its own and it's not reused in multiple systems. If it's reused in multiple places and it has a life cycle of its own, then having a Git repo for it makes sense. Another thing is config. You know, again, I see very often that basically people have a code and they have a different configurations for different environments, like dev, test, acceptance, and all those things. And then basically they build the code for dev, they test it, then they build for basically for test. Where actually, don't do that. You need to make sure that your code and, and configuration are completely separate. So once you actually build your code and you basically package the binary, you never touch it again. You just move it around, and basically the configuration for environment needs to be injected from the side of environment. In that case, if you have bugs or issues on, on acceptance, but you don't have on, on test, then probably it's your configuration and not your code. Backing services. Again, one of my favorite topics. I see that over and over again that people do very tight coupling with different kinds of systems, especially like databases and all, the, all other kind of stuff. If you want robustness systems, future-proof systems, those systems shouldn't be vendor locked. You need to make sure that if today you're using one database, you should be able tomorrow to remove the database, put some other database, and everything still needs to work. If that's not you, your use case, if you're tightly coupled with some systems, and then you decide that you want to break up the monolith, well, you might be in a, you know, a world of pain and problems, and you know, maybe you will not be able to actually move because of that system. See that, you know, I, I see it also, like, happening in real life. I love this one. Dev prod parity. All environments should be as similar as possible. This is in theory. In practice, who has like all environments exactly the same? Yeah, exactly like I thought, nobody. So do, do, don't be like stressed about it too much and say, okay, well, we are doing it wrong. Everybody is doing it wrong. So all environments usually are different. Important thing is that you're aware that there's differences, and again, to be, again, if you can, address them. But just if you're aware, it's still good. Of course, like the simplest thing is, the more they're like, you know, the less sleepless nights you will have. Okay, so reactive manifesto. Again, this is a huge subject. And again, I see it very often combined with the microservices. Again, this is much, much, much wider. It doesn't have to be only around the microservices. So we have a first block, which is basically responsive, which says our system should be responsive at all time. And I think that this is like common logic, you know, what's the point in having the best system in the world if, you know, if, if it's not responsive, you know? Users today want everything instantly. So if it's not like that, they will just walk away. Again, resilient. Our system should be resilient in the face of failure. And again, things will fail. That's the fact of life. True story is basically that, you know, like if we're building the nuclear reactor or, or we're building the weather app, we need different kinds of resiliency, right? Again, bottom line is, if the things go wrong, but your end users are not aware of it, all is good. And of course, resiliency leads to responsiveness. Then we have elastic. So basically, we want to have a system where if there is need, there is need for more capacity, we can basically add it. If we have too much capacity, we can basically easily remove it. So amount of capacity that we have shouldn't be static, but adjusted to the current needs. Again, if we have elastic systems, then it's more likely we'll have responsive system because again, if we have too many users coming, we can just add more capacity, problem solved. And of course, these two things you know, go one to one. To one. Well, last block is message driven. So I'm, I'm not going to read the definition, it's just too long. What it naturally means is with the message driven systems, we shouldn't care that much about other systems. The only thing that we need to care about is that we can send a message to them and nothing else. And we would, of course, expect for message to come back. This concept of messaging and just you know, sending it in, into a letterbox is very important because in that way, we don't have to think, okay, is that system under pressure or not? Because again, like, you know, they should deal with it. We're just going to send a message and you know, if they need more capacity or they, whatever, they're going to deal with it. However, we are breaking the tight couple between the service A and service B. Because if we send a message, we don't have a guarantee that the message will come back. 
or you know maybe the message will come back two days later. So then we need to think about you know what were we going to do if we don't get receive response or if it's just too late. And if we start building systems like that, then of course it's more elastic, it's more resilient, it's more responsive. And again, this is a huge topic, so I don't have a really more time to go through it. But it's much m you can have like monolith, which is doing all of this. Another huge topic is event sourcing and CQRS. Again, they're all very often also combined with the microservices, but again, they're much bigger than that. They can also be used on monoliths, on any kind of systems. Again, look into that. I don't have a lot of time to go through all of this. In a nutshell, with event sourcing, everything is event, and you basically keep uh, the, the log of the events. The idea behind this is if you have a problem with your code or there is some bug in your code, the only thing that you need to do is replay your events after, you, of course, you fix your bug in the code, and you will come to the right state. Uh, the biggest problem, usually problem that event sourcing has is that it's read heavy because again, if you have every single time to actually get some state, you need to process all the events, it's going to take you a lot of time. So that's why they create like a snapshot. Simple example is your bank balance account in the bank. So if we take, okay, putting money in your balance account is one event, taking money from your balance account is another event. So to figure out how much money you need, have on a balance account, we just need to look at all the events, do the plus and minuses, and all is good. But of course, we don't want to do that, so we're going to keep balance somewhere, right? So if there's an error and you see, okay, there is an error in my balance account, okay, we go, we fix the code, we rerun all the events, and your balance is good again. Another huge topic that, again, unfortunately, I don't have time to cover in details is CQRS. Again, something which is, for some reason, connected to microservices, although it has nothing to do with the microservices. It can be applied to any kind of the system. The whole idea about CQRS is that you basically split your application, so to say, logically into two parts, querying part, which is read-only, and command part, which is actually for changing the data. If you actually do this logical split, then your systems become much easier. Then, for example, you can basically create commands as events, so basically the, the data where actually commands are stored can be all the event log, but again, for the reading, you can actually like, create some snapshots and something that you can use to actually have a fast reads. And now we go to actually my favorite subject. The subject with every single talk about microservices is forgetting. I never heard in any talk or any, or, or any article about microservices, breaking monolith, about this. And this is the most important one. This is the people. Because in the end, who's going to write the code? People. Who's going to push that code into production? People. Who's going to actually support it when things go wrong in production? People. So you need to take them into account when you're making decisions about, okay, should we go A or B? Because in, in the end, if you want to say A or B, like you have some option, right? Will your people be able to go along the way? Will, will, they, will they be enablers? Or are they going to be a limitation factor? Do they have a skill set that they actually need to go to, on this journey? If not, how easy for you it is actually to teach them, you know, and, and to train them, to actually bring them on the level that they need to be? Or do you actually need to hire somebody from the outside who can actually bring the knowledge already and then share it around your, uh, around your people? You need to think about them when you're actually making the decisions. Very simple thing. DevOps. I'm a huge fan of DevOps. I really like the way of the DevOps and the DevOps way of working. However, I worked with all kinds of people over the years, and DevOps, for some of them, is just not an option. You know, they lack either the skill set or the mindset to actually work in a DevOps way which means that if you push them into DevOps way, they're going to be unhappy and unproductive. So then you need to think, okay, is the DevOps really the best thing for our, for our company or not? Do we need to basically hire it basically to, can we coach them into the DevOps way or not? So you need to take into account basically your crew and the people when you're going on this journey, which way you should go, what you should do and what you shouldn't be doing. Again, one thing that I want to point out, if you have a star on the horizon that you want to really go, maybe you need to you know, jump through the multiple systems and uh, multiple steps before you end up there. You know, so think about it. You know, like if you make too big a jump ahead, you know, it's, going to pain, it's going to be painful, and it's going to, you're going to lose a lot of people along the way, a lot of knowledge, and there's going to be just more problems. So maybe making a smaller steps and more steps is better, and again, to go to the end, north star that you want to reach. So let me quickly go through the summary. 
So basically, we talked about the microservices and the reasons why you want to go to microservices, because they're cool. But don't forget, there's also danger. We talk about multiple languages. But again, we talk that you should keep as small number of languages as possible. We talked about the fact that, you know, that a lot of people don't like their monolith because they're scared of them. But again, keep in mind, microservices can be even scarier. And also, like the, the consultants told us so, well, challenge that. We also talked about the, the monolith. So the things that you need to be aware before you actually start going on a journey is, OK, what's your dependencies? What are the data sources? Because that's going to dictate a lot how you actually can break up the monolith. We talked about the troubleshooting. Again, like what are the options that we have at the moment? Are they good enough for hundreds of microservices? We talked also about monitoring. If you don't have a good monitoring, please invest first in monitoring and then do everything else. I have painful experience in, because we didn't do that. We talked about deployment process. Is it good enough or not for, your, for going on a scale? Then we also talked about the journey. As we said, it starts with a question. Ooh, I'm out of the time. So basically, you know, what, we, what we're trying to solve, we talked about borders, domains, data sources, specification. Be critical about new connections. We talked about different types of deployment, troubleshootings, things like that. We talk, looked more into the 12-factor app in the Reactive Manifesto. It's a very good thing. Don't forget the people. They're the most important part. Thank you. <laughs> you Vlad thank you, Vladimir. Thumbs up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good. Any questions for Vladimir? OK, so you understood everything. That's good. Yeah. Or you're scared. So. That's terrible. <laughs> Again, I'm, I'm staying here, so if you have any questions, you know, just come exactly. and talk. Exactly. Vladimir will be around, so hang out, guys. OK, see you in five minutes. <laughs>